I'm Martin McIntyre, originally from outside Glasgow, now living in Edinburgh. Well, I'm going to tell you that 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 I'm to tell you that I'm going 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 to tell you proud of their children. But then unfortunately the uh, the Queen became unwell and a short while afterwards she died. And um, the King did what he could to sort of maintain the children but he noticed after a while that they became kind of unkempt and um, neglected looking. And particularly their hair which was long and straight had become you know really um, you know, really tangled and really um, unkempt looking and um, in other ways, he felt that he, you know they needed a mother to look after them, so he kind of looked around him to see who he could possibly man uh, marry, and he found this witch who lived in a kind of a forest under the sea, and he decided that she would perhaps be a, an appropriate woman to look after the children, and she was absolutely delighted. She was going to be the, the queen of this vast ocean dominion. Uh, she didn't care very much about the kids, and they didn't care very much about her. Um, and in fact, as time went on, she began to become increasingly jealous of the children and uh, how beautiful they looked and how, uh, how elegant they were particularly and of their, their tallness and their straightness until finally she couldn't take it any longer. And she got these particular um, herbs and these um, plants that she found under the sea and made this potion and cast a binding spell on them. And from that moment forth, um, they ceased to be long, tall, straight children, but we squishy, podgy seals, <laughs> and uh, they had to, they had to swim there, sort of, at their will under the sea, um, and the king was very distressed to see them swimming off. They no longer had the same allegiance to him as they had had, obviously, when they were his normal children. There was only one thing about the spell was, and that one day in the year from sunrise to sunset. They could come on shore, they could take off their, their seal pelts and become normal children again. Straight, tall, beautiful children with beautiful brown eyes who could sing and play on the beach. But then as sunset would about to approach, they had to put on their pelts again, go back into the sea, and that was them for the whole of the next year. And of all the places throughout um, Europe and the west of Scotland and Ireland where seals like to to play, to swim, the Western Isles have been a, always been a favourite spot, and particularly a part between Harris and, um, and North Uist called Coolest Neherig, the sound, the sound of Harris. Um, and there's a small island there called Bernary in between those two, um, two islands. And one day a fellow called Roedi Machcotram a local man from Bernary was walking the shore, as he was, as he often did, as people still do, to see what the sea had brought in. And um, he was just walking as he as he would on any normal day, and he heard these voices, these beautiful, sweet voices. And there was a kind of a sandbank <coughs> in front of him, and he climbed to the top of the sandbank, and he looked down, and what did he see? But these lovely, elegant, tall, gorgeous children playing and singing, the beautiful sweet singing voices as well, and he watched them for a while, but he was conscious that if they, if they saw him, he would immediately flee back into the sea and they would, he would never see them again. And he thought, oh, he's just about to go home. When he saw this pile of seal pelts, these seal skins, and he thought to himself, he was a, he was a bachelor and he was getting on in years and he was, you know, he still hadn't found the woman he'd been searching for and he was wondering whether he ever would. And he thought, he thought to himself and he looked at the children and he went over to the sealed pelts and he had a look through them and they were kind of a brownish colour, a rusty brown colour, or a reddish brown colour, but there's just one particular one which is beautiful golden brown colour, just without thinking too much about it really or considering the consequences, he picked it up and ran home. And when he got home, <coughs> he went into the house and he thought, well I've got to put this somewhere. And he stretched up to the lintel above the, the door and he put it up there. Where it, would, where it wouldn't be seen. And he sat down, he had some, me he had some um, nets to mend, and he 
other bits and pieces to do. And he waited. He waited for quite some time. And then when the sun had gone down, maybe an hour or so afterwards, he began to hear this kind of barking kind of wailing sound outside. He opened his door and there was this beautiful woman outside. She's totally distressed. She says, what's wrong? She says, well, she said, I'm from the sea, I'm a seal woman, she says, but uh, I was playing with my brothers and sisters on the beach and when I went to put on my seal, skill, seal skin, it wasn't there. She says, I must have lost it or something must have happened. I don't know what's happened at all. Can you help me at all? Can you help me find it? And he knew fine well that he could help her find it. All he had to do was stretch up from the lintel and take it down and give it to her and he could reverse her, her sorry state. But he looked at her and she was absolutely beautiful and he thought about his own situation. And he said, I said, oh, I don't know what could possibly have happened to your seal skin. He says, um, somebody must have come upon it and for some reason taken it with them. It was a beautiful seal skin. She said, yes, he says, I'm sorry that this has happened for you, he says. And he looked at her and he said, but if you, he said, if you were willing to stay with me, if you were willing to come into my house and be my wife, and if, if it's God's will for us to have children, I'll be a very caring, loving husband for you. And I'll look after you. And I'll make sure that you want for nothing. And she looked at him and she thought about her plight. And she thought, well, I'm never going to be able to go back to the sea. Um, he seems quite a nice man. I'll go and I'll, I'll take him up on his offer. So she did. And although he had stolen her uh, seal skin, he was true to his word. He was a fairly decent chap, and he was an honourable husband, and he did look after her, and she didn't want for anything. He was a fisherman, and he went out and fished all day and brought home fish for her tea. And they were blessed with children, a good number of children, and they grew up. The years went by. On this one particular morning, he was heading out fishing, and this hare crossed by him. There's a lot of fishing taboos and that's one of them. If you see a hare then it's an inauspicious sign. But he looked at the, the sky and well, you could see the clouds were beginning to gather but he said, ah, I'm a very experienced fisherman, many a time I'll get out of my boat and the, the elements have expressed their anger towards me but they've never sunk me yet. So he continued on and out fishing of course by the time he got about a mile out from shore it was really you know the clouds were beginning to gather and the wind was picking up and this you know this fierce storm was gathering and she was at home the same storm that was batting the house at home and she was inside with the kids well, with the younger ones the older one who also was called Rory was on the shore he was as mad about the sea as his father was and he was down about the shore and she was kind of looking after the kids and looking at the weather and he was out fishing and of course, as time went on, a very short period of time, really, a major gale began to blow up. So by this time, she's getting really worried about the oldest son, Rowley. So she um, she leaves the younger children just for a second. She goes to the door and she runs out the door to the edge of the croft and she shouts, Rowley! Rowley! Hikiachi! Come home, Rowley! Rowley! Hikiachi! She calls once. She calls twice. Doesn't seem to be, you know, she can see him in the distance, but... She can see that he, you know, he can't hear her, and then fortunately, on the third call, Ruani, he he turns, and she can see that he is intending to come home. So she goes back in, but she leaves the door open for him, um, so that um, so that she can hear him coming or keep an eye on him coming. And she goes back in and makes sure that the children are okay because they're you know they're up in years, but they're, you know the family have never experienced a storm of this of this magnitude, and in a short period of time. Rory comes home and you'd think that um, the way he's hurled through the door that he is he has absolutely no control about you know where he's going to go or how he's going to come in the storm just just throws him in through the door and slams the door behind him and of course what falls off the lintel but the seal skin and she just looks down in, in amazement and she sits and she she picks it up and then she turns to the children and she says just one word in Gaelic, which is sorry, which doesn't mean sorry, although I'm sure she did feel sorry, it means farewell, sorry, she says. She takes the seal skin and goes out through the door and down to the, the beach. She takes off her human clothes, puts on her, uh, her seal skin and enters the water. 
And that night, when he came home, or that afternoon, despite his, when the Rodi, the, the father, came home, he had, uh, he had a great struggle getting his boat in. He caught very little, and he thought he was, you know, thought he was a goner. But when he arrived home, the door was sort of flapping backwards and forwards. And when he opened it, you could see his children there sitting with very sad expressions on their face and no fire lit for them. And he knew immediately what had happened. That his wife had come back to the sea. And the children of that family, although they obviously, they missed their mother greatly, evermore after that, they did remember her kindness and her love while they had been there, while they'd had her as a mother on this earth. And from that day forth, they were always very careful to be uh, to be considerate and attentive to the needs of seals, and that's continued to this day. That the Makotram clan and the descendants of the Makotram clan have been particularly kind to seals from this day forth. That's mm. the story.